So if you're a parent or if you're a kid, this is the day for you. And so no matter where you fall, you're one of those. And we've all been children and we are children of our parents and we grow up to be parents and grandparents. And God speaks very clearly uh, how he wants us to be parents, children, grandparents, how we're supposed to be influencing this world uh, for our Heavenly Father. I have to say, this is my disclaimer, and uh, everything that I will be teaching to you today, uh, I will say if my children hear this message, they would go, but mom. So I do want you to know I was not the perfect mom. I continue to not be the perfect mother or grandmother, uh, but I do know what God's heart is. And so I still strive for that. I still strive to be a perfect daughter. Uh, my parents are still living. And so it. Uh, so everything you're hearing me say is what I'm still working towards uh, with my Heavenly Father. The only thing I'm not still working towards anymore is being an, an obedient child because I'm no longer a child. And so everything else, though, still on my bucket list to perfection. And uh, so hear this today with um, my heart that uh, as I prepared it this week, whew, Satan had a field day with me. Uh, I, I always find with praying and fasting month, my Achilles heel is the lies of hell. And so this week working on, um, on this, on parenting and children, uh, Satan hurled accusations and lies. And, but what was so amazing, because I am spending so much time praying and with the fast, was that God's truth was louder this week. It was actually amazing how I could hear his voice above the lies. And so I could, I could say, oh, wait, there's God. And I would say, God, I need you to make this stop. And so it was an interesting week, uh, not an easy week. But as I talk to people who are praying and fasting, there's nothing easy about this month. Uh, I've heard lots of horror stories and difficulties, and I just want to encourage you, hang in there. Uh, I am excited to see what God's going to do with our church family. I'm excited to see what he wants to do with me personally, uh, for my family that I'm praying for. And <clears throat> so as we're, as we're praying against hell, of course, hell is going to rise up. So we should never be afraid uh, of what Satan is doing because our God is bigger and he's mightier. So I'm sorry if it's hard, but I'm also excited because you're rattling hell's gates right now. And Jesus will have the victory. And we might not see it this month. And sometimes I think maybe I won't see it in my lifetime. But God takes these prayers and continues on. Like I said, they're infinite. Our prayers just keep going. So be encouraged. Don't give up. Hang on. Be steadfast in what God has called us as a church family to do. <clears throat> Whenever we take family pictures, have all of y'all ever done those family picture things? And they take 100 because in every picture, somebody's eyes are here or here or here. My son, Zachary, very often when he does our family pictures, he starts editing a head out of this picture and puts it into this picture because we can never as a family get everybody to do the same thing. So we had in 2019, December 2019, we got every one of, at that time, uh, my mom and dad in the middle, that's our family for mom and dad's 64th wedding anniversary. And I look at the picture, and Zachary did a little editing too. There's a few extra heads in there. And um, so I look at it, and I remember the day it was every member of mom and dad's family. How incredible is that? It, it never happens. But everybody came in so we could celebrate. This is mom and dad's farm that I grew up on. This was December 27th, 2019. Do you ever look at family photos and start looking at faces and you remember what was happening or you remember what's coming? So when I look at that picture, we were only supposed to be in the States for another two months and then COVID hit and our plane tickets got canceled. My parents got COVID really badly. We moved them off the farm. 
It's the last time this whole family will ever get to be together on the farm. I look at that picture and I also see I'm missing three grandchildren out of that picture that have been born since then. I'm missing a great nephew that was born since then. Lives have been changed, decisions have been made, mistakes have been made. When we see a family picture, we all look pretty, pretty good in the picture. But there's a story behind each picture, each individual face that you look at there. When we look at the Bible, the Bible actually shows us one after another family photo of total imperfection. I don't know that you can find a perfect family anywhere in the Bible. In fact, they're horrifying if you read the Bible. There's a lot of mess in the Bible of families. I don't know if, uh, if you would be you know, willing, if there is one child that has been the perfect child so far, would you stand up? <laughs> if there's one parent that has parented perfectly so far, would you stand up? It's not going to happen. Or you're a big fat liar. You know that's the way we can go with this. Yeah. (laughs) So when we think about how we do childhood or how we do parenting, we are in a great need for John 3.16, which says, For God so loved the world, you know this verse, that he gave his one and only son, whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That verse is not just for your salvation into eternity. It's for our help today. This verse means that we have God rescuing us. We have a Savior coming to fight for this imperfect mama, this imperfect child, this imperfect whoever you are. We have a Savior that died for us and rose again for this imperfection in us. When I think about that, I think there's my hope that Jesus didn't just die and rise again for me. He did that for my children. He did that for my grandchildren. And as we look forward to future grandchildren and great-grandchildren, he died and rose again for them. They need a Savior too, just like we do. God knew that I was going to be a mess. And I think about it this week. I was reminded of by Satan what a mess I am. God knew I was going to be a mess, and he made a plan. He said, you are going to need Jesus. And he was so right when he made that plan. Today, we are looking in uh, Ephesians 6. And Paul starts uh, continuing what he had already done. Uh, Brian was preaching on marriage in, in Ephesians 5 and how we're supposed to be husbands and wives. And Paul moves into a different role as he comes into Ephesians 6. And he starts with... Uh, Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord, for this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you, and you will have a long life on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. So in this, we have God painting to us what a family that really wants to represent Christ in their home. And he starts with the child. The child is pleasing to the Lord when the child is obedient to their parents. So if you're a child in this room, this part is for you. This part is your story. When you are obedient to your mom and dad, you are being pleasing to God. God calls us to this. And We find, though, that so often obedience for children is very difficult. Have y'all seen that in your children? That sometimes for them to obey even simple things is very, very difficult. So when we uh, think about that, we think, why is this so difficult for you? Have you ever said that to your children? Yeah. One time I asked Chad, I think he was three, I kept saying to Chad, Chad, come get in the bath. And I hear him giggling with his brothers and sister. Chad, come get into the bath. And he keeps giggling and playing. So I walk in and get right in front of this little booger, and I say, Chad, how many times do I have to tell you something before you obey me? And he looks so sweetly, and he goes, 89. (laughs) 
So 89 is the number. And so obedience is very, very hard. Why? Because we find obedience hard. We find that we do not like to submit our control over our lives. We struggle with that as adults. So why wouldn't children struggle with that? We saw last week that husbands are to be submitted to Jesus Christ. Wives are supposed to submit to their husbands. And then all of us are supposed to submit to each other. Ephesians 5.21 And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. We're all supposed to submit to each other. And I think this makes children obey your parents easier because we're all supposed to be putting somebody else first and submitting ourselves to other people. So children are supposed to submit to their parents. And it says, and the reason, there's a reason that it says, it is the right thing to do. Not just a suggestion. It is the right thing to do. But of course, somebody will go, kids always do this. But what about, and I give you some scenario. Well, you know, you hear these crazy scenarios, but Brian and I actually know somebody, um, she's not in this world anymore, she's passed on, but who actually asked her children to steal for her. So she had four or five children, and she would send them out to steal for her. So if someone is asking you to do that, you have a right, child, to say no. If it is contrary to our um, laws and our regulations, if it's contrary to what God has called you to do, you can say no. And in fact, the disciples show us that in Acts, uh, the Sanhedrin was tell were sending them out and saying, don't speak of Jesus anymore. And their answer in Acts 5.29 says, we must obey God rather than man. And so this is the, the, the line. Now, I would say, children, don't just flippantly say, my parents have missed it, they're crazy, I'm going to do what I want. You really have to sit before God and ask him if you're able to disobey a rule of your parents because it's not pleasing to the Lord. So God is the one we are to obey first and foremost, and then God tells us that we are supposed to obey our parents. And uh, obeying curfews for children, obeying all their rules, cleaning your room. Cleaning your room is a really an excellent skill to have. Um, Elko will remember the day that my uh, my son Chad had had the messiest room in Vintuk. It was a showcase for children everywhere. And Elka's daughter, Imka, brought her mom over very specifically to our house to show her Chad's room so Elko could see that El Imka's room was never that bad. She should be glad that she has Imka as her daughter. And, and I'll never forget Elka looking at it and going, this is awful. This is not even a standard. No, you still have to clean your room. I'll never forget it. So cleaning your room is a good skill. I have watched this son, Chad. We always had a rule that he had to make me a path from the door into his bed in case he got sick at night and I wouldn't hurt myself stepping on things. And so he would kick a path, literally kick it like this. So I was staying with him in December when the newest baby came and he's telling his girls, the six-year-old and four-year-old, okay, kick a path to the bed. And these little six-year-old and four-year-olds are kicking paths to their beds so their daddy can get to them in the middle of the night. Man, it's a, I'm glad we have passed that along. It's just awesome. <laughs> yeah. So, yes, there are some things that are important. And some things you might decide are not important. But God things are extremely important. I say, children, don't lose your parents' trust. Don't ever lose your parents' trust. I, I think uh, we always start with their trust, and in your parents trusting you, there is so much freedom when they trust you. There is, you can do anything if your parents trust you, because they trust you. You think that rules and all this are, are confining and like putting you in jail, but I'm telling you, if you obey your parents, they will let you do anything because they know you know the boundaries. My daughter, I, our family doesn't drink alcohol, and my daughter would head to parties, and I'd always say to her, if alcohol shows up at the party, call me and I'll come get you. 
And she, all, she would carry a Coke bottle in her arm and would go to parties. And one time, I, this is before cell phones, I dropped her off in Pioneers Park, and I lived in Eros at that time. And as I was coming into the house, the phone was ringing, and Casey said, Mom, they're already halfway intoxicated. Would you come get me again? So I left and went and picked her up again. She could go to any party she wanted. I never even debated it with her. If she asked me, I'd say, sure, because she always did what she was supposed to do. She had freedom. So teenagers, I'm telling you, obeying your parents, keeping that trust sacred allows you to do things that you actually want to do. And you can make those good choices and they will know that you are uh, worthy to be trusted. Then Paul brings in the fifth commandment. It's in Exodus 20, 12. Honor your father and mother, then you will live a long and full life in the land the Lord the Lord is giving you. This is to all of us, every one of us who has a parent. That's all of us. If you were born, you have a parent. True? If we are existing, we have parents. So even if they don't live anymore, you have had parents. And this verse is for all of us. So in Ephesians 6, 2-3, Paul says, Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you and you will have a long life on earth. This is the first commandment that God is saying with a promise. That's why it is so important. This isn't a trivial commandment. It was part of the top 10 in the Old Testament and now it's being brought back in into the New Testament saying this is such an important commandment. How do we honor our parents, whether you're a child or whether you're an adult? We accept them in that role. We accept the role of parent. We say, this is a God-ordained position. God has established the authority, that relationship of parenting. You know, we, we think about when we go um, to anything that, that, like if you go to a court and the judge, you might call him your honor. Or if I'm at a border crossing, I am very respectful to the officials there because I'd like to cross the border. I respect their position. I don't even know them, but I respect and honor the position. And that is what God is calling us to do. Respect and honor the position of parenthood. And so we appreciate that and we, we think about it. And then we do appreciate our parents. Take note of what they're doing. Take note of what they have done for you. I talk to my mom and dad almost every day. And it is sometimes short, sometimes long, but it always has the part of me just being reminded what wonderful parents I have. My parents, every day when I talk to them, tell me they love me every single day. And they always say, are we bothering you? Are you busy? And I say, do you still love me? And they say, of course we love you. And I said, then it's not a bother. You can call and tell me you love me anytime you want to call and tell me you love me. What do your parents do for you? What have they done for you? Think on that. Pay attention to it. It truly is amazing what our parents have done. Affirm your parents. Praise them in their presence. Praise them when you're away from them. Talk about your parents in a positive way. Do you know, I didn't realize till I had teenagers who uh, would actually not think I was so wonderful sometimes. I realized I need my children to affirm me. I need them to say occasionally, you're doing a good job, mom. Because this is a tough job being a parent. It's hard. You know, I was thinking the other day, I've heard it said over and over again that people would say, this is the only job that you get that lasts so many years, but no instruction manual comes with it. But then I thought, oh, does anybody read the instruction manuals anyway? So it, that wouldn't have helped you anyway. So, but we don't know what we're doing so often. So thank God for parents that were trying and affirm them and tell them that you appreciate what they've been doing. Teenagers, I would say talking badly about your parents to your friends is not honoring your parents. Talking badly to your friends about your parents is dishonoring your parents. I think when we deal with aging parents, I feel like God has called us to take care 
of our aging parents. That's a way that we honor our parents. And if you are married, your spouse's parents are also your parents. So we take care of both sides, your own personal parents, your spouse's parents. This honors our Heavenly Father as we honor our parents and take care of them in their aging. I have found with my parents as they're aging that they're changing. And um, some days their uh, minds don't work so clearly. And I have had to ask God, I did this a couple of years ago, would you help me to enjoy who my parents are today? Whoever they are today, help me to enjoy this day of my parents telling me they love me. The other day recently, my mom, I was telling her, she, her and my dad how much I love them, and mom said, oh, I... So she was having one of those days where her mind wasn't going well and her words were hard to find. And I said, it's okay, mom. You've always loved me. She says, yeah, but I don't know how to say what I want to say. And I said, you've shown it to me my whole life, Mom. Just say same. Just tell me same, and I know what you mean. And she said, you do understand, don't you? And I said, my whole life I understand. And Mom says, same. I feel like that's honoring our parents as they age, that we don't expect them as they're starting to get older to keep acting like they used to act. They just don't. And we just pray for them and we be kind to them. And we listen. Maybe some parents say the same thing a hundred times. My goal, what I say, answer it a different way each time. Put a challenge on yourself. Don't have the same response every time. If you answer in a different way, it takes the conversation to a different direction and you find out even more. I think it's awesome. I think it's wonderful to do that. You visit your family. You make phone calls, maybe you write thank you notes or letters, you tell them how much you appreciate them. And I believe so often people are honoring their parents only when they're standing at the funeral and they miss the time when their parents were alive to tell them what they meant to them. Don't miss this time. Do you know that Jesus was the only teenager that's ever lived who actually knew more than his parents did? Isn't that awesome? Think about it. The only teenager that could say to his parents, you're really stupid, aren't you? But he didn't. He didn't say that. He honored his parents, and he submitted himself to his parents. Ask God if you have parents that are not real honorable. Ask God to help you forgive them. That's also honoring your parents and keeping this commandment. Ask God to help you to release them from these things and you will find that God will bless you with that. Things will go well for you, and you will have a long life here on this earth if you honor your parents. Then Paul uh, moves to the parents. Ba 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 ba. Here we go. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up in the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Paul says fathers here, but we can, we can move it to parents. But fathers, I would say... Take heed, take note, take, take a warning from Paul when he's saying, do not provoke your children to anger. In Ephesians 6, it says, parents do not provoke, exasperate, frustrate your children. Why? Colossians 3.21, again, fathers do not embitter, provoke to anger your children, or they will become discouraged. They just give up. You've seen kids that give up. Just like, I can never please you. And so they quit trying. So how do we provoke our children, moms and dads? How do we not provoke them? Let's go that way. Don't take your bad day out on your kids. Take a breath before you walk in. Pray a prayer before you go home if you've had a bad day. Ask God to be your peace. Ask God that your kids would feel blessed by you when you walk in the door, when you come in. Don't expect your children to attain all your standards. They're your standards. Don't have unattainable expectations. Don't frustrate your children by saying one thing and doing another. We are our children's examples. Always, we are our children's main examples. They are watching us. We need to live consistently with the life that we are actually speaking. We have to live out what we are talking to our children. 
One of the best ways to correct our children is to correct the example that we're setting for them. That would be the first start. Correct us, and then it will start correcting our children. How's your language at home? Are you a gossip at home? Do your children hear you talking badly about people? Are you a complainer, a grumbler? Do they hear that? What's your attitude like? Are you a whiny person? Are you grouchy all the time? Do your children see you serving with joy or with complaining? Are you kind to everyone your children see you with, whether it's the person at the store, a police officer that's pulled you over, whatever it is, do your children see you being kind to everybody? Do your children see you be humble, that your pride is always in check, that you have a humble heart as you're serving your family? Parents, do not frustrate your children, but part B, rather bring them up with the discipline and training and instruction that comes from the Lord. What does it mean to bring up our kids? It doesn't mean we're just biologically raising them. It means that we're, there are actually things that we need to be doing to be raising and bringing up our children. We're to raise them in the discipline and the instruction that comes from the Lord. That's the example that we're supposed to be doing. We expect training for everything. We go for training. Brian and I are always being trained with our organization. You train for sports. You train in music. We need to train our children in godly ways. I recommend as you're training, listen to your children. Ask God to help you to hear their hearts as well as their words. When your kids are talking to you, don't react, but pray. Be praying while your children are talking to you, that you can hear really what they're trying to tell you. Be patient with your children. Give them grace. Kids mess up. They do. Friday night, I always do the baking and everything all week long and make popcorn. And the children are always wonderful to run to the car and help us carry things in. They're so sweet. Can I help you? They always say, can I help you? And they run to the car and help us. So I was carrying a load and a child was behind me and I hear crash. So I turn around and all the popcorn is completely across the, the ground down here. And this sweet child, she's standing like this, like that, this horror on her face. And I said, it's okay, it's just popcorn. And she just stands there, she didn't even speak, she just keeps standing there. And I said, it's really okay, it's just popcorn. I made it so I can tell you it's okay. And she's just looking at me like she wants to cry. So I go wrap my arms around her and I said, it's just popcorn. And Sibylla comes up and she goes, hey, I've done that before too. It's okay. So I watched this child, I don't know her very well. Does she get yelled at when she drops something? Maybe. She was terrified that she was in so much trouble that she dropped the popcorn. It's just popcorn. Who cares? So what's our perspective over these things? How do we help our children grow up without feeling like they've been condemned? Also, your children need to have discipline. This is a big one. Children, I'm sorry, but this is true. Your children need to have discipline. One time we had a, a YWAP parent come to my gate with a child who I knew, and the mother said, does this kid come every Friday to your house for YWAP? And his eyes are begging. Please stand alive for me. So I look at him and I say, I'm so sorry. So I turn to his mom and I say, no, he's never here at YWAP. And they left. Discipline. It's not easy. Parents, it's not easy. I hate discipline. It's hard. It's exhausting when we have to be disciplining. In Hebrews 12, 5 and 6, it says, and have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? He said, My child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline, and don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. You are first their parent, not their friend. As your children grow up, we get to be their friends. It's awesome having adult children and getting to be their friends. But when they are children, you are their parent and they need discipline. Brian and I sat with a young man one time crying. He was crying in our kitchen, telling us 
His parents, he used the word beat, so I'm going to use the word beat. I don't know exactly what that meant to him. But he said, when his brother and sister do something wrong, his parents beat them. He said, I do everything wrong, and nobody ever beats me. And he's crying. He says, I am the unloved child in my family, and I don't know what to do about it. Brian and I were just in shock. A teenage boy crying because nobody disciplined him, and he knew that he needed some boundaries. Ask God to help you to show affection. Some of you are not affectionate parents, and it's not your fault. It's just your personality. But your children need affection. They need to be hugged. They need to be touched. Um, James Dobson says, if you have a break in relationship, don't ever break in touching. Even if you come and just rub their back and keep moving, you need to keep touching your children to keep that line of affection going. <clears throat> keep your promises to your children. Admit when you've messed up as a parent and ask your children to forgive you when you need to do that. In Psalm 122, 1, it says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our world is becoming more and more evil every day, and statistically, fewer people are going to church in the history of our world. Less and less, we're finding that people are taking their families to church. Very often, we hear parents say, I'll let my children choose when they become adults. You don't let your children decide if they go to school or not. You allow them that instruction. You give them a gift of making them go to school. Why would you not give them the gift of bringing them to church and letting them have the instruction of church and of God's word? <clears throat> make sure that you make church a priority for your family. Of course, you're all sitting here, so we're speaking to the choir, but <clears throat> make sure your family knows this is important to you. And even when your children don't want to go to church, you say, this is what we do as a family. My parents, I would play a ball tournament and get home at 2 o'clock in the morning on Sunday morning. I didn't even ask. I knew we were still going to church. I would not even question it because that was my family. We were taught church was a priority. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. <clears throat> and then teach your children how to make wise choices. Teach them to go to God in prayer. Teach them to run to God about everything. Tell them how to talk to God. Pray with your children. I don't know if you pray with your children, but man, praying with your children is the sweetest thing. When they tell you us a concern, then you pray with them. Pray with them right then. Pray with your children. And I love that that's not awkward for me ever because I've done it my children's whole lives. I have prayed with my children. This week, our, our youngest son, they thought he possibly had had a heart attack this week. And so <clears throat> as I, as he called and I prayed for him over the phone as he was rushing to a hospital, I talked to him last night and he said, you know, Mom, just knowing that you and Pop were praying was everything. And, you know, it just, I love that that child knows that we run to our Heavenly Father. And boy, I did run to my Heavenly Father. He did not have a heart attack. But all night long, staying up and sitting with Jesus on the behalf of my son, where else would I want to be? There's no better place for me, for my children, for me to sit with my Jesus. Are you teaching your children that? Are you teaching them we run to Jesus when our heart is scared, when it's broken, when we don't know where to go and what to do? <clears throat> and then it says, instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. We need to teach our children the value of God's Word, teach them that by them watching us read God's Word, that we talk about it, that we enjoy it. It's not a discipline, it's a have to. I love reading God's Word. I love being in it. I love what God says to me. Teach your children that this is something fun in your life, not a have to. It's fun. When Jeremy, my oldest, was a, a little boy, <clears throat> his first dad was always reading his Bible, always. And um, he was three years old and was sitting in a chair with a Bible, but it was upside down. He was just sitting there. 
Okay, every time I come through the room, I see him, but he just had this upside down Bible like this. And I said, Hey, Jer, what you doing there? And he said, I'm going to stare at this book until I can read it like Daddy does. And I thought, there it is. This is the example that we should be to our children. They should recognize we treasure this book. This is so, so special to us. Are you making sure your children are growing in the knowledge of God's word? In Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 7, Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you're on the road, when you're going to bed, and when you're getting up. When do we not talk about them? Never. When you're driving your kids everywhere, talk about God's Word. Talk about God's principles. When you are going to bed, pray with your children. Talk about who God has been to them in the day. When they're waking up and they're eating breakfast, I used to read uh, Max Licato to my children as they were eating breakfast just to give them an encouraging word for the day. And we would talk about these kind of things. Max Licato is very breakfast friendly, if you want to know. That's always a good one and has good discussion uh, things that you can do. But I love where it just says, repeat them again and again. Most of us do not have the kind of willpower that if we hear it once, it's enough. Repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. Tell your kids what God's teaching you. Teach them that you have a wonderful God. As we learn to be parents from our Heavenly Father, I go back to my wise mama saying, she used to always say, every generation should improve on the last. Every generation should improve on the last one. My mom said, Dana, be a way better mama than I was. And I said to my daughter, Casey, be a much better mama than I was. And I see it. My daughter's an incredible mama. I'm so proud of her. She improved on this generation. And that's what we should be doing as we come to Jesus. As children, as parents, we give ourselves to our Heavenly Father and say, here I am, a mess. I need a Savior. Will you help me to do children, doing children better? Parent better? Would you help me be the person you have called me to be? I have seen children, I want to stress this to you, this church uh, was started in 2001 and it was called the Youth Church. And I think uh, the Yagal family was uh, one of our very first families in this church. And this church had all these children in it and lots of children and it started growing with children. But children started leading their parents to Jesus. Can you imagine that? Children's lives were so awesome that parents started wondering, what's up with this kid? And their parents started coming to know the Lord. And our church started not just being a youth church, it started having adults. And one day we had a, a fellowship and I saw someone pushing a baby in a, a stroller and I saw gray hair and I went, huh, we're a real church. We're a real church family now. We're not just a church for youth. We're a church from top to bottom. What is your life showing from top to bottom? Children, are you a witness to your parents? Are you a witness to your friend by how you behave, obey, and honor? Adults, are you a witness to your children? Are you a witness to the world? for how you love your children and bring them honor and bring your parents honor. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for how you love us in all of our messiness, Lord. We need you. Lord, we thank you that you, yeah, you give us all we need, all the tools we need to be a child or to be an adult and a parent. Lord, I pray that as we walk away here from here, we don't feel condemned, but we feel encouraged by a God who has grace and mercy and forgiveness. So thank you, Lord, that you would change us individually and as a church to love better than ever before. In your name I pray, Jesus. Amen.